It's all yours, Chris and Dara. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna. Oops, hold on. Um, hey everyone, uh, today Chris and I are gonna talk about influence and influence tactics and the some of the research that has been done about influence. Uh, to give you an idea of the agenda, Basically, we're gonna talk about what power is, how it differs from influence, and then how can you use it? So uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been at Pacific for quite a while. I won't say how many years. Um, and I have a PhD in organizational behavior from Illinois and I basically teach international management. I teach strategy and entrepreneurship as well as coaching. Chris? Yeah, thank you. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Sablinski. That's me on the right. The tiger is not me. I have a PhD uh, from University of Washington up in Seattle in organizational behavior and HR. Uh, 30 years experience in a variety of different organizations and a uh, variety of different projects. And um, what I love about tonight's topic is that you can use these uh, strategies we're giving you right away. So starting tonight, starting tomorrow, uh, these things can help you. So we've seen it uh, in our careers and I've had a chance to work uh, you know, in a variety of organizations. Uh, and teach a variety of undergrad and grad classes. So thank you all for coming here uh, to join us on Zoom. So we're gonna do a quick exercise and Margaret's gonna help us, have you? Uh, and we're gonna put everyone into a breakout room. So we'd like you to do two things. One is obviously say hello and introduce yourself. And then secondly, talk about how you successfully influence someone. Oops. Are we ready to open the yeah. break rooms? Yeah. There we go. Great, yes, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Hi there. If you have not joined your breakout room, please do. Say hi to your fellow students and alums and folks interested in tonight's topic. All right, welcome everyone, welcome back. Uh, again, my name is Chris, Chris Sablinski, and I would like to get uh, a couple of volunteers. So what techniques have you used in your life to influence someone? What are some ways to get someone else to do something? Who would like to volunteer? Um, hello, my name is uh, Ranisha. Um, I think the best way to get someone like for you to influence others is kind of like to lead by example. If other people see you doing well and doing something um, that maybe they want to do or something they aspire to do, they kind of like want to follow you. And that's kind of a, um, you know, kind of 
it's more of a lead by example type of thing is another way that you can influence others, I think. Okay. Ronisha, thank you. Uh, anyone else sim have a similar theme? If you can give us the icon, uh, thumbs up. Anyone else talk about lead by example? So Mariana, I see, Philip, David, Nancy, thank you, Nick. Awesome, thank you. Andy, thank you all for uh, chiming in, we love it. Great to see all of you here. Uh, how about one more? Another way to influence others to, to do something. What did you talk about? I guess I'll just break the silence. Um, let's see, I mean, there's a lot of examples. Um, one that I mentioned was that I was going to host an event and I originally planned to set up myself and like prepare for the talk and then also bring pizza, but I didn't have time to bring pizza. So I asked someone else to stop by Costco and bring pizza. And that's a simple way of influencing someone to do something. It's a simple example. All right, good, right? So sometimes if we're leading something, we have that authority or power. And I'm adding to Daniel. Daniel, thank you, by the way. Thanks for being here. Always good to have you because I know you're going to volunteer and I love it. <laughs> now, um, you know, one way to do it is, hey, you know, we need help. Can someone go get pizza, uh, right? A, a simple request, uh, especially if you have the authority as a club leader or uh, something similar. Did anyone else have that as something you talked about in your breakout room? So again, if you can use your thumbs up. You know, if I may, yeah. <clears throat> um, I feel like Ronisha summarized almost anything that you could even possibly throw out there so well, because whether that's having passion in what you're doing or you're being kind and making requests as, as a leader role, whatever it is that you're doing, it's contagious. And so, by doing something that exemplifies just a, a good a good example, it automatically inspires other people to want to do that because they they see the results and they, and they enjoy that. So, just my two cents. Yeah, Nick, thank you. Good to have you on here. Long time no see. Hope you're doing well. Glad you remember uh, me. Come, of course. You know. We're like elephants, all faculties. No, don't, don't, don't. Thank you. <laughs> um, good. So, right. I love that because one of the things we're going to talk about tonight, it's, it is a contagious thing, right? So we're leading by example. We're asking for help, um, word choice and the uh, ability to convey information to people. So they want to do something when it's voluntary. It's so powerful. So thank you all. That was our breakout room to kind of get things started and, and thanks for doing that. Remember, if you joined us in the first session that we had, Dara and I had a session a month ago, uh, we talked about your strengths and the Gallup Strengths Finder. If you were there at that session, you learned a little bit about what those are. Tonight, we're extending that. So if you weren't able to join us on the first one, it's okay. These are a, a, a sort of a you know an add on to that. But, how do we get people to want to follow us? We just had a national election. How did people get votes, right? And so all of the things we're going to talk about tonight, you're going to see it. Uh, once you finish tonight, you'll never be the same. How's that for a dramatic follow-up? So Dara, I pass back to you. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing and I'm gonna so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the difference between power and influence is so uh you know when we talk about power we're really talking about what is beyond behind somebody's influence over somebody and whenever we talk about power or influence, the assumption is that there's an interdependency. If there's no interdependency, then you would have no reason to do something for someone else, right? You, would, you wouldn't have any reason why. If somebody asks you to, you know, a stranger walks up to you and says, can you give me $5? Most likely, 
unless you're feeling particularly charitable, you probably won't. So power is the basis and influence refers to the method or strategy by which people exercise or use their power. And so tonight we're gonna give you some methods so that you can be more, that, so you can understand how to be more effective with your influence. Uh, you know, I, I think it's really important to ask the question, what is power? And part of the issue with power is there's not a great agreement with it. A lot of times, what do people say when they when you ask about power? If I said to you, how do you define power? You might say, well, I can't define it, but I could tell you people I know who have it. Jeff Pfeffer at Stanford defines, he wrote a whole book on power and he defines it as the ability to get things done. People who have power are the ones that can accomplish whatever the tasks that they want and need to get done. And then sort of a more uh, straightforward definition is just the idea that it's when you have the potential to influence other individuals or groups. So the question really is then, when we talk about power, it's where, where do we get it? How do we, we know we want, most people want it, or at least some of it, right? How do, how do we get it and where does it come from? And often we talk about one type of power, which is positional power. And I think often when we talk about power, that's what people think of. They think of positional power. That is, I have power because of the position that I inhabit. The CEO has power, maybe, hopefully, because he has great ideas and a great strategy. But a lot of times the organization will do what he says because he has formal authority. That positional power might be because the person is really relevant to the organizational objectives or they have centrality or maybe they're a gatekeeper. So, you know, they always talk about that the CEO's executive assistant has a lot of power because that person can act as a gatekeeper and decide who can see, who can see the person and who can't. Uh, Chris, do you wanna talk about the other two types of power? Sure, of course. So, you know, think about it. Um, a lot of people we know in our society, in business and organizations, uh, politics, right? Any sort of institution, um, this idea of having um, a link to the goals of the organization, having a link to other people, having a sense of um, sort of a relevance to the goals that we're trying to achieve. And I may have control over a budget or resources, or I'm the person who gets you access to the DeRosa Center if you want a, a room to have uh, an event for your club, uh, that kind of thing, right? So. On this page we begin, or this slide, you start to see that there's some component to resource allocation and your ability to know what you're doing. So the personal power I'd like to draw your attention to on the bottom left, you can start taking action on that today to begin to become more influential. And one of the best ways of doing it is know things, read, in your classes, pay attention, listen, right? Carefully understand the connection between different uh, functional areas of business, right? It, you may know a different language. You may know, um, right, how to program. You may have some information about how to, uh, you know, get uh, uh, maybe uh, donations or, you know, your connections to people. Uh, so expertise comes in a lot of flavors, if you will, and reference, uh, I kind of highlighted that one, is this idea of being likable, of being 
uh, someone that people want to encounter and talk to and follow. So you hear terms like charisma, or they have some you know, aspect of their personality or persona, I wanna follow them. So again, just to simplify, uh, be likable, be professional and know things. So the more you educate yourself and the more you're able to work collaboratively, you begin to uh, build your power and influence as a leader. Thank you. Dara, back to you. So um, this, this is a picture of Robert, Robert Cialdini. And he's, uh, he's one of several um, scholars who've looked, who really studied the idea of persuasion and influence. And he, Chris, would you agree? He's probably one of the most famous out there yeah. of social psychologists? Not only do I agree, he says so himself it's on his self. website. He calls himself the godfather or they, I think he said people call him the godfather of influence. So right. we highlighted right. him because of that. And I always laugh. I tell students when I cover this in my classes, that book on the right of your, uh, on your screen, uh, I went to visit McGeorge when I first started working uh, at Pacific. I went up to the campus in Sacramento and that was a required book for a law class. So what we're covering is not only useful in you know, management and leadership, but in sales, marketing, uh, and uh, law. So yeah, he's the godfather of influence. So he came up with six ways he's added to it, but we're just gonna talk about, we're gonna give the big six in this particular talk. And he said, basically what he argues is that there are these six categories of, of influence tactic. And it's not, what's important is what are the social psychological principles that direct or push human behavior? So he's saying, look, I didn't come up with these. What I did is I identified the way people already act. And I said, how can I use them more? How, how can people use them to influence or persuade other people? So I have a little uh, um, question here. So if you have two options to introduce to a client, one that is more costly and the one that is less costly, which one should you present first? And, and should I, what should we say? Should we have them put a thumbs up if they think less cost? What do you think? I was gonna say, uh, let's have everyone go into the chat. What's your guess? Okay, yeah. A, less costly or B, more costly. So I'm trying to sell you something. Should I give you the one that costs more first or give you the one that costs less first and let you pick? B is the resounding winner so far. Okay. A gets a vote, B. B, all right, thank you all for chatting. Thanks for typing it in there. Uh, it's really fun to do these. Um, do you mind uh, if I cold call, meaning if I ask you um, so Nancy, uh, if you can unmute your mic uh, and just say hi, and if you don't mind telling us, um, why did you pick B? Um, hi everyone, I picked B because, you know, I'm starting to actually second guess it and think it's more- um, Sorry, I, I accidentally- <laughs> Oh, it's all right. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to switch my answer to A. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did we, wait a minute. Did we just influence and persuade? <laughs> exactly. <you? laughs> Oops, sorry. What's going on out there? Right. So, okay, let's play with it. Um, why would we, let's, let's just play with each one. So I got to sell you something. I'm going to sell you this pen. Okay. So if you can see it, there's this pen. If I say this pen is $10 and I have a different pen, if you don't like this one, well, I have one for 20. What, what do you think happens with people who see that comparison? So I start with one that is 
less expensive and move to one that's more. What 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 do you think would be a benefit of that? It gives people a comparison, and then um, as far as like I used to be a salesman, and well, not a salesman, I was a saleswoman. But um, in sales, what you do, you always offer the most expensive one, and then you um, also put the cheaper one out there because you really, you know, that way you'll give them an option, even though you really want them to go with it. You know, you always offer the one you don't want them to go with first. And then you offer the one that you really want to sell them as a sidebar. And it usually works. That's why I picked the more costly one. Yeah. And that's why I usually give two options. So people can have a choice and they can feel like they made this decision on their own. Yeah, good, right? A lot of retailers do that. Thank you, Ranisha. A lot of retail, um, a lot of websites do that. And they give you options on items. And really the idea is, you know, um, we're going to get a sale and we're going to hope that you, you know, choose the more expensive one. It's better, right? A higher profit margin, et cetera. But uh, by comparison, people like to know, right? Kind of getting a bargain, getting a deal. So um, thank you all. Dara, should we go on to the next? Yeah. So what, what's driving this issue of how things are done is, is the idea of reciprocity. And we use reciprocity all the time, every day. A lot of times we don't even think about it and we're using it. You know, it's a, the example we gave here is I'll drive you to class and you can help me with, the, with my paper. What we think of is sort of the good old give or take, but when you do something for someone, it, it gives you credit, right? It puts you in their debt and people feel a need to repay the debt. And uh, so what you learn from that is you should definitely ask at first, right? You wanna move. The uh, Cialdini tells a really great story of a um, student in his class who he was explaining this reciprocity and, and she said, you have finally um, explained something we've been trying to figure out forever. And he said, what's that? And he said, well, I, we got a, a Christmas card from somebody and we had no idea who the person was. But it wasn't just a regular Christmas card. It was a Christmas card that had like, you know, here's what we've done in the past year, the little note. So we got this card and I said to my husband, well, do you know who the card's from? And the husband's like, I've never heard of these people. And so I said, well, we have to send them back a card because we send out cards with the little note too. So we did. So we send out the card. And every year, a card comes back from them. They, and so we send a card. So my son is going to a school in San Diego. And these people happen to live in San Diego. And well, we need somewhere for my son to stay for a night before he can get into the dorms. And so I say, well, do we know anybody in San Diego? And my husband says, well, don't you remember? We always send it to, we always send a Christmas cards to the Turners. Let's call the Turners. So we call the Turners and the Turners are like, no, of course your son's not gonna stay in a hotel. Your son's gonna stay with us. We know all about Chip. We know he was in Little League and we know this and we know that. They don't even know if they've ever met these people, but reciprocity is so strong that they make the offer. So here's another, here's another quick example, if I can, let me just get it to work. Oops, what just happened? I got you a little groomsman present. Oh, oh, that's that's a fantastic four, annual number three from 1965 in mint condition. The one where Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Girl get married. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> I was afraid of this. What? 
while a thoughtful gift, this comic book in this condition is worth at least a hundred dollars. Yeah, so? I bought you and Bernadette a gravy boat worth eighty-eight dollars. <laughs> Which places me in your debt, and I can't be in your debt because someday you might ask me to help you move. Or to kill a man. I doubt he'll ask you to kill a man. What if it's his only way out? I can't risk it. Here is twelve dollars. Now what even? Yeah, wait, 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 wait. I bought a car. Give me two dollars. For the record, this is why I hate gift giving. <laughs> hey guys. So you get the idea of the reciprocity. All right. Question two. B, sorry. What is the best response when someone says thank you after you've done something for him or her? You're welcome. Anything for you? I know you do the same for me. It's okay because now you owe me one. Or E, always glad to be of help. So once again, in the chat, put what you think the best uh, response to this is. Nice. We've got a few different letters. A, B, E. A is winning. Always glad to help. That is so awesome. Dara, would you like to reveal the correct answer or shall I? I will. I'm okay. happy to. Well, maybe, if it, <laughs> hang on. If my computer works, I will. There you go. C. So, right, take a look at that. Thank you, Dara, take a look. Why do you think C, right? Of course, I'm gonna say you're welcome. That, that's, you're polite, that's courteous. You're, you're a wonderful person. You say you're welcome, right? Anything for you, you can also say that right? Because you care about somebody, maybe it's a friend or family member. Uh, we'll skip to D, right? It's okay because now you owe me one. That's way too heavy handed, right? That makes it sound like I did something for you only because I want you to be in debt to me, right? What we just saw in the Big Bang Theory. Or number or letter E, always glad to be of help. Of course you're glad to be of help. But the way that Cialdini tells us to get the maximum, I would recommend combining some of these, say something like you're welcome, but then some kind of variance on, I know you would do the same for me. That is enacting reciprocity. And so a lot of people feel like, oh, I would never do that, right? It's my friend or family member. I'm not gonna say you, you know, I, you would do the same for me, right? My cousin, right? Yeah, you know, like it's weird. Uh, again, use these in a comfortable way, but he's basically telling us in the research he's done, that's the best way to have someone help you in the future. The point is you wanna prime them that you did them a favor, right? They asked you to do something for them and you were happy to do it. You are welcome. You would probably do it again, but you don't want them to take advantage. Right? You don't want to just bungle it away. You want to you want to be able to utilize that reciprocity and say, yes, I did do you a favor. So, so reciprocity, you know, this idea of reciprocity, it only works if both sides do it. I think we've all had relationships where you feel like you do all the work 
and the other person doesn't. Like they're always calling you to pick them up or they always need something from you. And after a while, right, you, it, those relationships tend not to last because people don't like that feeling. The great thing about these favors is you can wait a really long time to call it in. You don't have to do it right away, but it is a moment of power after that person thanks you, right? It is a moment of power, so you don't want to bungle it away. This is also true in negotiation. This works with concessions, right? You wanna have a concession strategy when you're negotiating. You don't just wanna give it up. Moreover, you want to let people say yes to you. You wanna give them the chance, right? If you ask for something that you really want and they say no, then you want to respond with a moderate request. You know, you don't want to leave and come back. You want to ask that right then. When somebody says no to you, it's counterintuitive, but that is a moment of power because they told you no. So fine, you can't do that. How about this? Anything else, Chris, that you wanna? I, no, thank you. I always say, you know, in, in our world today, no means no, and there's no doubt about that, no pun intended, no yeah. means no. But in negotiation, in a scenario like this, when it's a business transaction, you know, learn to embrace no. No is your friend. No is your friend if you're negotiating. So would you like to buy this pen for $10? No. Okay, if you can't do 10, how about nine? So in that moment, you don't back away and lose that momentum because they're likely, if you give a concession, they want to return the favor. And that's the psychology of it. It's, it's really kind of fun to watch. All right. So question C, same, let's use the chat. Should you tell a prospect that you are trying to sell something, what they stand to gain by acquiring your product or how much they will lose if you don't follow, if they don't follow your ideas? Look at all those, a lot of lose. Lose is winning, lose is not losing. Look at all these pro negotiators out there. Exactly. Dara. Look at them, everyone's got this down. So you may see this in a lot of classes actually in the business school, in marketing, in, in conflict management, negotiation classes. So. Um, yeah, Dara, would you like to give the official answer? Lose. So does somebody want to say why they picked lose? Is it because psychologically people are more afraid to lose something than they already gain something? Yes. They're more content to hang on to something that they already have than they are to lose something that they already have? Absolutely. And managers in particular are very afraid of losing, right? They're much more worried, not about, you know, about showing a loss, for example, on the books than they are about showing a terrific gain. Okay, and the reason why and I just want to say that it was Chris who came up with the picture for this one. Right. That was me. It's the principle of scarcity. So you want to, Chris, you want to, you want to talk about scarcity? Yeah, I, I mean, come on, we've all seen that, right? Um, the pandemic is horrifying, right? COVID-19 is absolutely scary and please wear a mask, take care of yourself, take care of others. But we saw in the spring in the, in the US, especially at Costco and the lines, uh, right? People were leaving with paper towels, but toilet paper, 
look, I don't want to get too gross here, but I never quite made that connection, but whatever, let people do it. The thing is, it triggers this herd mentality, right? Suddenly there's no more toilet paper. I got to stock up on it. And so if I can't have it, I want it. If I can't get it anywhere else, it's even more valuable, right? We're calling different states. We're trying to find, do you have toilet paper, right? I'll drive 200 miles to get some. Come on, right? The other thing we know about scarcity, um, you should not avoid telling people what they can gain. Cialdini and the research is not saying that. You certainly want to tell people the advantage of getting your product, your service, working with you, and you have to include that loss as well. So don't just not tell us about a good thing, but use that thing uh, that they may lose if you don't don't do it. So that's a really important part. You know, and and you always see, you know, if you think about like the late night commercials, right? For two, you know, you have to, you know order within the next, you know, 10 minutes, right? Or this is the only area you can get this. All of that is using the principles of scarcity to try to motivate buying behavior. Yeah, and I'll just add, I have a good friend who's uh, working at HSN uh, on the East Coast in Tampa, Florida, and all those numbers are real. And so those, when they tell you the number you can watch on HSN, especially now uh, for the holiday season coming up, those numbers at the bottom of the screen, they're real. And it took somebody who knew a little bit about this idea to put it in there. Suddenly it's like, I got to get this. We're running out of blue, right? There's different items, a vacuum, right? Whatever, your vacuum's red or blue. I don't really spend much time showing off my vacuum to my guests. I don't know about you, not judging. But right, the blue one's going, right? No, everyone's buying it. Suddenly the blue, I need to get the blue. So it's popular, I want it. And if I don't get it, I'm, I'm upset. All right, so next question for everyone. Here we have a newness of information. If you have new information to share with a prospect or manager, when should you tell them? Early or late? So yeah, thank you. If you can put it in the chat, what do you think? A or B, early or late? It's a lot of A's. Hint that you have something but wait to tell. Oh, look at Daniel putting a spin on it. All right, thank you all for playing. If we can get the official answer, please, Derek. Oh. Uh oh. <laughs> there we go. Why was the swordfish jumping? <laughs> You'll see. You're oh, gonna sorry. See. Okay. <laughs> Got it. So early. Yeah. Anybody want to give a guess as to why? Um, the sooner that a person knows the information, whether good or bad, the the quicker they can do something about it, especially if it's bad information. If you give bad information earlier, there's a possibility that they can counteract the problem. Um, but good information, you know, there's a reason to celebrate, I guess. Yeah, that's, th thank you, Ronisha, thank you, that's great. Dara, I think if we wanna show them on the next slide. Oh, sure. It's the idea of freshness or exclusivity. Well, I don't know, maybe if my, Let's see, it's not. That's where that sword. That's where the swordfish is. Got it. Right? New information, see? Fresh, yeah. out of the water, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was better than the files you had. Come on. <laughs> right? New information is better than old, right? We're really talking about the freshness of information. People like to think that they know something new. Ronisha, like you said, they can act on it then. They have information and they can act on it. 
Yeah, so, it, you know, sorry. information is more powerful when it's fresh. And so if you have information, you need to really act on it. And that, that means say it, show it, speak up with it. Anything else, Chris, you wanna to add to that? No, let's All right. keep Question, next question. All right, if your proposal or idea has a weakness and what doesn't, is it better to point that out early or late in the presentation? All right, thank you all. We have a, quite a few votes, A for early. Nice. Okay, drum roll. Yeah. Can you show it? Why not? Okay. It's late. <laughs> Do you want to take this or you want me to? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So this this has to do with the idea, the principle of authority. And, and what it is, is that you want to establish your authority, show how you're trustworthy, how you're, how you, you're knowledgeable, you're credible, you have power, and then point out the weaknesses of the, of the idea or presentation. So this is what we would call uh, approach number three, authority. So, you know, and when we talk about authority, sometimes we call it the power of the white coat, that there are certain, uh, that, that there are certain signals of authority that people take uh, for granted. So you see somebody in a white coat, if you're in a hospital, you don't usually ask, why are you in the white coat or what's your, you know, do you know what you're talking about? The assumption is there. The idea of expertise, if an expert says it, it must be true. And that the strongest points overwhelm any uh, weaknesses in an argument. Any, Chris, anything you want to add on that? Uh, no, just for the sake of time, uh, let's keep going. We got a okay. couple more to do. Okay, here we go. Question F. Let's say someone you want someone to like you and cooperate with you. What can you do to make that happen? Should you compliment them professionally, right? We, when we say this, right, everything is professional. Point out your similarities with that person or be cooperative and focus how you can work together with that person. All right, so put it in the chat. Answer one, two, or three, please. Three is dominating. One or two, two final answer. Okay, Regis, thank you. Okay, so this is a bit of a, of a, uh, what can I say? A, uh, it's all of the above, right? Compliment them. Show how you're similar, be cooperative. And, and the, the approach we're talking about is the approach of liking, right? We like people that like us. That's why flattery works so well, right? People want to say yes to people they like. If you don't like someone, you're probably, it's not very hard to say no to them. 
and how do we get people to like like us right through three ways right showing our similarities we like people who are more similar to us than others explains a lot about what's going on and how people vote and how they look at the world right we like people who compliment us we really some people like that even more than others right and we like people that cooperate with us these are the the liking approach is quite strong chris you got anything to add to that yeah, right. Again, thank you. Uh, always keep your compliments professional at work. So you can compliment someone on, you know, the presentation they made or, you know, the report that they generated or the way that they handled a, a tough situation. It, it, be specific on that. Um, that helps, right, people connect. Uh, and yeah, you know, that's why when you see folks trying to sell you an automobile at a used car lot, Right, you get out of the car, and the first thing someone comes up to you and says, "Oh, you you have a car. We have cars here," and you're going, "Of course, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard." But it starts the idea that we have something in common. Suddenly, when you right try to close the deal, you remember, "Oh yeah, I like this person. We have a lot in common." So it's amazing. Sometimes it's so like obvious in your face, and you just roll your eyes, but it works. It works. And it works if you can try to find something similar with someone that you might think you don't have anything in common with. Yep. So approach number five is consistency. We like people who do what they say they'll do. We like people who are consistent. And we particularly like it when people build on small commitments, right? You ask your coworker to do something for you. They say they will, and then they don't do it, right? You're already, you're, you're unhappy. One time, maybe you're like, okay, it happens. Two times, right? You're not going to go to that coworker. You might go to your boss about the coworker, right? We want people to be consistent. We want people to come through in doing what they said they'll do. And then the final uh, approach is what we call social proof. We like, um, we look, we look, we are, humans are social animals. And so we look at other other members of our of the of, of society and social to look for clues how to act and and how to be similar, right? And so why is it that celebrity endorsements work so well? Why do you know why do uh, brand managers spend a lot of time looking at social media influencers why are they called right what's the word that's used influencer right we want them right oh they like the product why don't i t it seems to help them why don't i try it anything on that chris or keep no i i guess uh i'm slipping i gotta get on TikTok. i gotta start <laughs> videos back here because i you know no i mean Right. This is we we follow things, and the more it's like, then people share it. And right again, uh, totally apolitical. But you just saw it in the the national elections, right? Uh, national election last week, right? There's a lot of people looking around. Who should I vote for? And you know, there's different events and different activities and social media. And you know, you have to be able to understand that it's not necessarily about the person or the platform. Uh, that people vote for, it's what did my cousin vote for? What did my cousin support? Suddenly, the power and influence is not about the person or the topic. It's about the others, right? We are creatures that don't, we don't like to stand out. We don't like to be seen as different. And so we follow. Um, again, I didn't say that's good. I just say we have evidence that says people do that. So uh, to sort of wrap, wrap us up, 
to talk, you know, what the, the six principles are reciprocity, authority, scarcity, liking, consistency, and social proof. And if we were together in person, Chris and I would both give you a little card that had these six principles on it, because I know you do the same for me. <laughs> so, so what are sort of the PowerPoints or what's one of the takeaways? One of the takeaways really is, yes, you're trying to influence others, but always assume other people are trying to influence you. So what should you do, right? You should acknowledge that, that's perfectly fine. Of course, they're trying to influence you, but you should also be proactive in your desire to try to influence other people. So, you know, what is it that allows people to influence people? It's not just one thing, right? It's not just reciprocity. You, you know, it's not just that you drove your manager to the car dealership and then now they're going to owe you, right? So it's lots of different things that combined together are going to give you the ability to influence. So you want to continue to think about and always be taking steps that enhance, that allow you to enhance your power. Chris, any? Uh, no, no, just wanted to. All right, I'm gonna skip that, just be given, given time. Yep. So the last thing um, that Chris and I wanted to talk about was given that we were talking about influence is to really have you guys think maybe a little more broadly about what it means to win and what you know what does it mean if you are trying to influence somebody what does it mean to win in a situation is it that you get group agreement or that it's majority rules is walking away from a situation where you're where you're not going to get what you want out of it is that winning is it just maybe minimizing your losses and then really thinking about if either if you're in a situation where you're trying to exert power or influence what do the other members of the group want is it that everybody wants the same thing or are people looking at something else. And then I'd end with saying, you know, winning may not mean getting what you want. And that's that's a hard, you know, that's a hard idea to swallow because here we are talking about how we can influence people, how we can exert power. And now I'm saying, well, you might not get what you want even after you take all these steps. But, you know, winning may be having a voice in the conversation influencing outcomes, even, you know, sort of, you know, winning, the, losing the battle, but winning the war kind of idea. Recognizing that certain sources of power are fixed, right? Positional power. If you don't have that position, you're not going to be able to change it. Others are movable, like expertise. And power is always dynamic. So it's always going to be shifting and changing. So uh, I guess we'd end with, if you have any more questions, please feel free to contact either Chris or I. We'd be happy to talk more about these issues. Anything, Chris? Yeah, yeah. thank you all for being here. We're trying to get uh, wrapped up as we promised. So- uh, You wanna you know, be consistent. Yes, and if you act now, I have additional <laughs> ideas for you, but you have to contact me within the next 24 hours. Right, you it's, to get they're very to, fresh. <laughs> right? No, I mean, honestly, that's the kind of stuff that gets our attention. So I hope we helped you a little bit tonight. Um, in all seriousness, thank you for spending a Thursday afternoon with us. Our emails are here and we're the only ones uh, in the business school under you know, our last names, you can't miss us. So right. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. Um, if you need anything, reach out and I guess we'll pass back to Margaret to wrap it up.
Fantastic. And Dara, if you wouldn't mind allowing me to share my screen, I'd like to sure. uh, highlight for the folks that are on uh, the call with us who we're going to have joining us uh, in the last uh, series that we're offering next Thursday. We'll be talking uh, about a day in the life of a consultant. This conversation next Thursday will be moderated by Professor uh, Brian Newport, who's one of our adjunct faculty members. He's also an MBA alum from the Eberhardt School. He will be talking with Chelsea Mackern and Juliet Rippert, who are Julian Rippert, who are both uh, working in the uh, consulting industry. Julian just graduated last year in 2019. And Chelsea, uh, like Brian, is an MBA grad and has worked in technology consulting since she uh, finished our MBA. So please come and join us next week if you're interested in learning about a, uh, a day in the life of a consultant. And uh, with that, thank you everyone for joining us and have a fantastic Thursday evening.